1948, lived in Barnesville, Ohio. My father was a farmer. We also worked construction, laying brick. And there's a, if you remember flying out to the cabin, there's a big red chimney up, brick chimney. He laid that, it worked in that chimney. And he said it was so high that when you went inside, you could see the stars shining like it was nighttime because there wasn't enough light to take it, you know. So it looked like, looked dark and he, he laid that chimney up. And then he lived in a, there was a farmhouse in the barn. And then down over the hill was the house. And when I was first born, when I, they took me out of the hospital, he lived on the farm and worked the farm, and he and Grandma lived in the house down over the hill. So he, he, he always felt real proud because he said it was the first house in, uh, in that county that had running water in the bathroom. And what, what it was, when I finally, years went on, he told me, we looked at the old house, and I told him, I said, well, where'd you, where's the bathroom in here? She had running water in here. He said, well, I said, I built the outhouse over top of the creek on board, so it had running water. You know. So I got a big kick out of that. But he said it snowed real bad one time down there, and I was maybe two, and I fell, I went outside the front door on the porch and didn't, mom didn't know it. And I fell off the side of the porch and went underneath the snow. The snow caved in on top of me. And she couldn't find me and got all frustrated. And went up and got Grandpa at the top of the hill and came down. And they figured out I, I was underneath the snow. So here they shoveled me out. Dad said it was like it was in a snow cave there. So it was rugged, rugged weather. Mom said all she ever saw was uh, the mailman. And he delivered mail with a mule and uh, he, he had one eye is all he had and says he saw a one-eyed man with the, and, the, and the mule was blind so he said they delivered the mail so it's pretty, pretty primitive down in there and then uh, dad got a job up at uh, B&W in Barberton and so he moved up there so I moved out of the primitive woods at about three, four, three or four and uh, moved up to Norton. So I grew up there in you know, school and went to high school at uh, Wadsworth. Met my lovely wife there. Uh, she was 15 and I was 16. I got involved in sports and played football. I didn't play any other sports, just played football. Worked at, I worked at a garden Wadsworth Gardens, it was a big truck patch. I used to work all week, Wadsworth Gardens, and get paid on Saturday. And I'd stop and, at the Dairy Queen, Dairy Queen still up there, the little ice cream store. And I'd stop at the ice cream store and get a hot fudge sundae, reward myself, and then when I got home, I'd give Dad the extra money to help, you know, pay the bills and whatever. And I worked there from 12 till I turned 16 and I had a driver's license and I went to work for Bixler Electric and worked for, for Bixler Electric until I went in the Army. And I went in the Army and got all shot up and got went home, you know. I was there eight months, eight, nine months, I think, and uh, got caught in an ambush. It just, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of kind of comical because a fellow by the name of Selznick, who was from Cleveland, Ohio, was in my unit and I was the, the team leader. I was a buck sergeant. And we, there was a, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of the old cemeteries over in Southeast Asia and stuff there. They're about, oh, about half the dis, about this tall, with a brick wall around it, stone wall, and they had people buried in there. And Selznick and I were there at that cemetery 
and we walked inside to look at the stones they had up in there, and we heard this kind of clack, 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 clack sound. Couldn't figure out what was going on. And we looked up on the hill, and here there was a tank that came up over the hill. Now, the U.S. military had tanks, but I never saw any. They were out in the jungle, you know, so I didn't know where they used the tanks. And I thought that was odd. And Selzick and I thought, well, that was odd. And we kind of waved to them. And all of a sudden, we heard, saw that top of that tank turret turned faced our way and we saw this big red star on the side of the barrel thought oh man here that's the North Vietnamese so they lit us up they lit that cemetery up but they didn't want to desecrate it I think so they used little uh, they were like little little needles about as long as your little finger is and half that size and shot these needles at us so went all in, all around that cemetery, and finally he and I snuck outside and got away from it. Got back to where our unit was. We were platoon, so there's maybe 30 of us. Kind of gave him an idea what was what, and it's just about getting dark, so the tank went off because we called in some rounds on it from the base, the artillery base there, about 15 miles away, and they dropped something that scared the tank off. So then the next morning, we got up. It was still almost dark, but there was nobody in the village, nobody outside, nothing. Saw one old cow walking around. Thought, well, that's odd. No, no dogs were barking or nothing. Thought, thought that was odd because they, they wouldn't have known we were out there. Would have, didn't think, but they did. And so we went around the we were by the cemetery, we went around the cemetery and then through this cow pasture and hill went up, trail went up over the hill. And so we decided, you know, who I had no use for. Lieutenant, he's a lieutenant and real cocky and definitely wouldn't be somebody you'd want to follow. He was he was the team leader. And my unit was an alert team and we were a four man team. And we never were with the platoon. When we got into a space like this, and they wanted to know what was going on, they sent us out, and the four-man team, we went out and surveyed everything around, would radio back and let them know what was up, and we're never really with them, but this time we were with them down there. And so we were going up this tra- started to go up this trail, and said, you know, we'll go up top of this, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, ah, I don't think that's smart. I said, better let us go up the LERP team and we'll check it out. We'll see if it's okay. But I wouldn't go up there. He said, well, don't tell me what to do. He said, I'm a lieutenant. You're just a buck sergeant. And he had been there maybe two weeks. I'd been there nine months. And I said, ah. He said, well, I'm giving you an order. Boom. So I said, all right. So I told my team was four of us. I told, told them, I said, you stay down here at the bottom of the hill and be back up, and I'll take. And so anyhow, we got up top of the hill, and when we got top of the hill, boy, just hill might as well have blown up. They had a MVA, and that tank had seen us, and I'm sure they had their lerps, and they went out and found out we were a platoon not just two guys standing in the cemetery. And they alerted the villagers to stay inside and then they sent this ambush up and, and that's when I got hit and got all busted down, trees flying around. I just, I mean, it was, it was like it was like your body goes into slow motion. So when it's slow motion, I could actually see trees falling down, small ones about this big around, but it was moving real slow and then, uh, you know, I felt getting shot and I, I got shot in the knee first and I fell down I got up and you're, you're always trained the only thing you can do when you get caught in an ambush is assault because if you they're lined up and if you run to the left or retreat back they got you in their line of fire the whole way and on a hill you know they get you running down the hill so the only thing you can do is, is attack so I attacked and a couple other fellows 
and everybody got killed except myself and two other guys. So anyhow, you know, those we, we got through the ambush and they took off and you couldn't see from here to you away in that jungle. So you could I don't I don't they, I don't I don't remember seeing any of those. I just remember getting shot so I knew you know somebody was in there. So we never I never did see anybody. And they called in a helicopter and lifted me out and then came back and got the dead guys and I was remember I was sitting in the hospital, laying in the hospital. They they took me in, and there was a big round stainless steel bowl, like you'd have in a meat plant, and about three three feet off the floor, and, and dished in it. And they put me in there and cut all my clothes off because you know had so much blood going. And they brought a hose down. And they had an x-ray thing up on there, and they brought the hose down, they hosed me off and got all the blood off. And anyhow, they saw where I was all shot up and then rolled me over in the, like a gutter and washed off the backside of me and my knee and stuff and looked around and then took me down. And I was gone, woke up, and, and they sent me. That was down at... Uh, base hospital there. Then they sent me to, to Quinyon Hospital, and that's where they really evaluate you. So anyhow, I was there for whatever, and they shipped me from Quinyon to, uh, and it took me to Tachikawa, Japan, and I spent a long time there. I don't know how long, but long enough I got over there, and they were trying to decide if they were going to cut my leg off or leave it because it got, infect, got pretty bad infected. They decided to take me to the hospital room and they'd make a decision when I got in there. And when, when I got out of the operating room and took me back to the bed, the fellow beside me said I'd been out for four days because they gave me uh, morphine, gave me morphine because I had like the stitches, if I showed you my leg, go from the back of my knee up to almost my groin. And they cleaned all that out, and they saved the leg, though. They didn't cut it off. I was glad with that. But they had these big, like, baler, baler wire. You know, like some balers use wire. And they were all twisted together. There was little pieces of them all the way up to my leg and my shoulder where they, they sewed me up. So they kept me on their morphine, and I kept rolling over, and I could see the trees walking. And I told the guy beside me, I said, man, I said, you know, the trees are walking. He said, nah, you're doped up. And then I'd go out again, and they'd give me more morphine. Finally, I got clear of the morphine, wasn't seeing trees walking anymore, but I was hurting a little bit. And I asked that guy where he got hurt. Now, I was feeling sorry for myself because I got shot four times, maybe five, don't know, but shot four times, I got shot in this cheek and out, went out this side of the mouth, so I don't know if you hear that, and I was crunches when I, when I moved my mouth real wide, so I had quite a few holes, and I asked that guy, and I'm thinking I'm shot four times, and I said, how many times did you get shot? And he said, oh man, I got shot uh, 18 times. I said, 18? He said, yeah, I got caught in an ambush, got knocked down first shot, and the guy had a machine gun, and I got hit nine times up this side here. He said, and so I turned, rolled around, got on my belly and rolled around the other side, and he shot me nine times up that side. I thought, wow, I couldn't believe that. I said, and you survived? He said, yeah, I did. And so I said, wow, so they sent me back to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And when I got to Fort Knox, Kentucky, they, they hadn't taken the wire stitches out of, out of me yet, but when I got to Fort Knox, Kentucky, they took them out there. And, boy, and, and I was awake. I thought, well, they could take you in the hospital room. And they said, no, we, we just we twist the wires and snip the ends off so they don't have that curly cue on them, and we pull the wire out. 
Ow! That hurt, boy. I pulled those, all those wires out. And then I uh, called mom and dad, and they came down, picked me up, and they sent me home for 30 days. And then I had to report back to the barracks and then go for doctors. So anyhow, they, I, I was home for 30 days, and everything healed up pretty good, and they sent me back to the hospital, went before the review board, and they offered me a medical discharge. had strings attached to it, though. I'd be discharged. I'd still be in the Army, but I'd be on the register. But I'd be sent home, I forget what it was, a year or something. And then I had to go before the review board again. And if I was found fit for any kind of duty, I, I would be taken back in and serve my time that I was home. I think it was two years. Serve my time that I was home plus the time I had left in the Army then. So you're looking at four years in. I, I'd say, wait a minute. I told them, I said, I said, you can forget that. But they gave me a T3 profile. And that's limited you on what you could do. And what it said on there was no, pro and I was a paratrooper, you know, jumping out of airplanes and infantrymen. So I got that paper and bought me a car, a Comet Cyclone, 65 Cyclone. And they sent me home for 30 days leave. You know, even though I'd been home already for, how long was I home? Three months? So I was home for three months, but they gave me a 30 day leave and orders to, to report to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 82nd Airborne. So I got my T3 profile and looked at it and it said on there, no prolonged running, no prolonged standing, no prolonged sitting, no prolonged on down. I had a list about this, this long of no prolonged whatever. So basically you couldn't do anything. So I took the profile, I just folded it up, threw it in my bags, and I went down to Fort Bragg and reported for duty. And I'd grown a beard and didn't even look like I was in the Army, and well, they didn't like that. And they told me to get shaved and report the next morning to the 82nd Airborne, so I did. So I reported to the 82nd Airborne, and they put me in with the, in the barracks with the fellows who were in there. And I hadn't pulled my profile out. I hadn't said anything. I just, look, they ain't gonna look and I ain't gonna tell. So, and I was hurting somewhat. But anyway, they came in one night in the barracks and they surrounded the whole barracks, big brick building with Constantina wire. And I said, hey, that ain't normal. What's that, you know? And they said, well, you got, you got orders, this whole units going to be sent to Nam, it's a unit to 82nd, tomorrow morning at 0800, and I said, whoa, I ain't going back. So everybody in here, I said, maybe they'll work it out over there, and I said, I oh. don't, so I quick got in my, my car and got my T3 profile, and that's when I used my T3 profile, I said, might as well leave me here, I ain't going over, you know, I couldn't. So once they found I had a T3 profile, they Everybody, they shipped everybody out, so they're all gone. I was the only fellow there. So they made me the guy inside the upstairs top who was the boss, but basically, you know, you told people when, when they could go and when they could stay, and but there wasn't nobody to tell. You just sat there. So I said, man, this is a bunch of crap. So I, I made a couple of jumps with them when I was down there, but I didn't jump. I was the safety NCO, so I didn't pull my thing in, but I pulled the, the T3 profile for that up there. And they, uh, let's see how they, they found out, but there's no way they could send me to Nam, and they were going to leave me as an orderly up in the room, and when new troops came in, you know, I, I said, nah. I just quietly went out and got my T3 profile, tossed it in the garbage. And then I put an application in for drill sergeant school because they were always wanting guys for drill sergeant school, combat veterans. So I, I got approved for that and a couple days later I was shipped out and I was in, in uh, South Carolina. I think it was Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I went to drill sergeant school.
And uh, it seemed odd because here I was already a buck sergeant. I'm going to school to be a drill sergeant, but that school was tough. It was tough. It was so tough because you had to be an example and teach the others that your footlocker, according to Army regulations, they have a book that says your toothbrush should be one inch from the top left-hand corner, half inch from the east corner. And gave definitions for everything. socks had to be tight and on and on the top thing and blah blah blah. And then you lifted it up and then your pants and shirt and stuff were underneath there. And they had to be spotless. So you took first thing you did was I went in and <clears throat> took my foot locker and got a jar of Elmer's glue and I glued everything down on my thing so it stayed the same way everything and then I had a bag out in my car that I used to brush my teeth and soap and stuff and, and left those in there and the bed I slept on the floor everybody did because the bed had to be tight enough that that drill sergeant would come in in the morning and flip a quarter and it had to land on the bed and bounce off you know, it had to be that tight that was hard to get that way. So you made your bed and put your locker and fixed it all up. And the drill sergeant would come in there in the morning and hang his pants up. And you knew, whoa, he was hardcore. And you had to go all through drill sergeant school. And then they'd look, look at who you were and what you did and what your service record was. And then they would pick the top man and they'd give him a pay raise and a pay grade up, shoot him up a, a stripe. So pretty good. Gave you, gave you 600 bucks, a pay grade increase, and a sword. Not, not a junkie sword like this one, but a real nice shiny one. But yeah, you, you had to go in for the general and they examined you. So I remember I went in and Everything was spotless. I went in and they locked my heels and said, you know why you're here? And I said, yes, I do, sir. And I saluted him and all that. And he said, well, you become highly recommended uh, as being a top graduate. I said, but, you know, we reviewed your records and heard what the drill sergeant had to say and you were number one. And he said, but there are, we were interviewing a couple other fellows also. And I said, that's fine. And he said, but one thing, one thing we got issue with, your hair isn't short enough. And it was, I mean, it was this short. He said, you a reason for that? And I said, yes, sir. I said, I'm getting married three days from now. And he said, well, you can get your hair cut before you leave here. And I said, no, I, I said hey, I'm not getting married in my uniform and I'm not having a bald head, so that's off the table. That was it for me. I'm done. So, you know, they picked uh, some guy from Cleveland. But I drove home and uh, tried to wash off the army off because we're getting married, you know. But anyway, went to drill sergeant school, married Bunny, went to drill sergeant school. Couldn't wait till I got out, and then finally, well, we were there for a year maybe, and I got my discharge papers, so I was getting out, so man, was I glad for that. I wanted to put the Army so far behind me that nothing to do with it anymore. But the one thing that was good is, is I was rated on that T3 profile they, they, they didn't discharge me out of the Army. They discharged me to Wade Park uh, VA Hospital in Cleveland. That's where they discharged me. So I had to report there, and then they examined me. And because of all my wounds, they, they gave me 100% disability, which was pretty good income. I was pretty good, so went home and uh, started pouring concrete with Don Brogan Concrete Construction because my dad worked there. And they took it easy on me a little bit because of disability and went to work for them and then, well, yeah, I'll tell it just the way it is. 
you know Denny Madigan comes and visits me once. Well, Denny and I are, were high school buddies, graduates together. And when I got out of Nam, and he got back from Nam, he went to work for uh, Grandpa, pouring concrete myself. And so we worked worked together, and I was going living on living on Blake Road in the middle wood, woods, just beautiful place to live. Loved it. Farmed a little bit, but Denny's car was out at Laconi's. Used, used to be a beer joint down on Greenwich Road, so I was taking him out to the after work to get his car. And we were driving down the road, and the night before, the night before, I was riding with Motorcycle Club, and they owned I owned a motorcycle shop with them because uh, I took some of my disability and put it in there and funded the thing first. Went into the bar. I mean, it's all interlocked, so I got to tell this part. I went in, we went in the bar for a beer, and a fellow by the name of Fred Perkins, ironically, and an outlaw, I met him somehow, and he needed a place to keep his motorcycle for in the winter. So I said, well, hey, I live way back in the woods, and I got a grenade on the door. You know, I'm an old soldier, so... Nobody will steal it. It'll get blown up maybe, but it won't get stolen. So he took his bike out. I kept it out there that winter. And it was just turned spring, just getting ready to... I mean, it was getting warm enough to ride. But if you were a former tough guy, you rode when it's cold. So I rode when it's cold up to this motorcycle shop. And it was up in Akron. I, <clears throat> and we got done in the shop. And somebody said, let's go get a beer. So we rode, we, we rode in the car over. Yeah, and I went in, went in, and I saw some fellows up at the bar who had outlaw colors on. So I knew they were outlaws. And I walked up to the guy, tapped him on the back, and he turned around, and I said, "Hey," I said, uh, "Do you know Fred Perkins?" And he says, "What the blankety blank do you care?" So I'm just asking. I said, "He keeps his motorcycle out at my." place and I watch it for him and it's good enough now to tell him he can come anytime and pick that up and he cussed me out about something so I and he went to hit me and so I had in that interim in that time I was home because I was disabled and couldn't really defend myself I became a black belt in karate so I knew a lot of stuff and this fellow went and swing at me and I I killed him. There's no two ways about it. I killed him. I just hit him one time, and he, there's a spot here on your throat. And I came to throw. I just smacked him. Down he went. And all the guys who were with me in the in the shop there, Hell's Angels, they everybody's getting ready to get 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 it on. They said we're going to get you out of here. You just killed him. You know, let's go. So they got me out of there and took me back to the. Club, the clubhouse, the motorcycle shop, and then I got my bike and I rode home. I thought, oh man, I screwed this up. Went through Nam, went through all that, got a successful motorcycle business going, and here I go and drop this guy. Man, you know. <laughs> but I thought, well, truth is, cops probably don't kill one biker, kills another biker, but. Did I know that? I didn't. I thought with my luck, a guy would be an undercover cop, dressed as one or something. So I got home, got in bed with Bunny, and, and I just poured my heart out to the Lord. I said, Father, I mean, I had a background of Christianity, but I really was never walking. And I said, oh, Lord. I said, I screwed this up. And I said, I've killed this guy. I said, one, killing him is enough. But now, after all I've been through, I'll go to prison. I was really, I said, I, I said, whatever it takes to make me a Christian. I never understood, and I confessed that to him, and I got up the next day, went to work, and I was taking Denny out to the Coney's to get his car. He drank too much the night before, and somebody took him home, and his car is out there after work, so I went to take him home, and I'm going down the road, and this guy's standing right in the middle of the road, right, right, a couple hundred feet up from the Coney's. I got out of the car and I said, what the? 
blank, blank are you doing? I said, you get killed sitting now here in the middle of the road. And he said, I, he said, I see, how did he say that? He said, the Lord hath heard your prayer. Oh. He said, and he's brought me with the message. Oh, I shut up and he said, you know, here's, if you repent and follow him, here's your life. Here, here, here will be your life. And I showed three boys, all in, getting in a canoe, and I get in with them and we paddle down the river. And I got this wonderful family and this wonderful life. And he, and he said, and if you don't, he said, here will be your life. And it showed these boys growing up, drinking, raising cane, ungodly life. He said, and then you'll stand before the Lord someday. Give a count. Whew, boy, I was shook up. So we had stepped off the side of the road, so the traffic would hit us. And I got back in the car, and then he said, what the Sam hell was that? And I said, I just had an answer from God, prayer. He says, well, I heard you talking to that fellow, but I didn't, couldn't see him. Couldn't see you. And the road. And I said, well, yeah. So I said, well, let's, let's go to Laconi's. And you got to get your car. And he said, yeah. So I drove down to Laconi's, and we got out of the car. And I'm so thick-headed, I was going to go in and have a beer. So I headed toward the, towards the door to get a beer, and all of a sudden, my jacket got pulled up over the top of my head. And I got spun around, thrown up against the car. And Denny said, what the? He said, who are you fighting? And I said, I uh, didn't say much. I got the jacket back down. And Denny said, I'm, I'm going home. I'm getting out of here. I said, all right, I'm going home too. And I got back in the car. And then I drove home. And I never drank a beer since then. I never even thought about it. Just the Lord knew I was hard-headed, you know. So I, I gave it all to the Lord and went home and, Told Bunny, you got a new husband, didn't I? Took my motorcycle jacket off and threw it at the bottom of the steps and said, you got a new husband. I said, I've repented. So I did, so I told Denny, and then I called Billy Bird. He was the head of the fits and told him, you can have the shop. I said, I don't want anything out of it. I said, I don't, I'm not a holy roller, but I ain't going in there no more and I ain't nothing else. And so I left. When I left, I left. And I kept thinking that the outlaw biker in there, like called his name was nickname, I, I don't know what his, didn't know what his real name was, was Chicken Plucker. And I, so somebody told me, well, Chicken Plucker put a hit out on you. I said, he, I didn't kill him? He said, no, he lived. He's, he's alive. Spent some time in the hospital, but got a contract on you. And I said, oh, man. So, well, that's part of paying for your sins, I guess, the way it is. So I just went about my business and devoted myself to the family and kept working the farm. And I was a uh, Morris Mennonite man. His family was put out of the church. But Morris came up and said, I heard you want a farm. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I've got heifers to farm on Greenwich Road. He said, you can live there rent free if you feed the heifers for me. So I said, all right. So. I was ready to do that, and he came up and he said, well, he said, the boys don't want the farm. I don't want to sell it to just anybody. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, uh, maybe you can work out something with the boys. They're getting the farm, with me. I think they want to sell it. So I thought I had it made, because I was living there rent-free, and all I had to do was feed, feed heifers. But the boys came up and offered me the farm at the right price, but the house was in rough shape. They said, we'll give you was it three thousand dollars to fix up the house? And we fixed the house up inside. It was needed some work, so that's how I got up on that hill, which was good. You know, I was out of town. I was up on the hill and farming. And they got rid of their cows, and I had to have something, so I brought cows in and started milking. Became a dairy farmer. Didn't know anything about. I knew farming, but I didn't know anything about dairying. I mean, I'd milked it a little bit, but not run a dairy. So we struggled along, and Sean was, was he born when we 
moved up there? Mm -hmm. He was probably 10. 10 maybe, yeah. So that, that worked out well, real well. I mean, we got the, the farm there and... Stray voltage. Stray voltage. Yeah, that's right. We went through a stray voltage problem. I got put milkers on the cow. First morning, I remember I went out to put milkers on. And the cow actually jumped up in the ground and, and fell down. I thought, what? So she got back up, and I couldn't hardly even handle her. So I moved the cow behind and reached up to wash off her cheeks, and spark jumped from there in my finger. And I thought, whoa. So the cows wouldn't come in the parlor. I couldn't get any milkers on them. And we had about a 90-pound average, 90-pound herd average, because so, I was disciplined then, you know, and it went to zero. Couldn't get the cows in. But I noticed it was funny because at night, they or the morning, they'd come in. Leery, but they'd come in and kind of stomp around and whatever, and I could milk them, but at night, they wouldn't come in at all. And I'd have had a double four herringbone parlor that I put in, and I'd have eight cows, boom, go right to the floor. Boom, what in the world? And here, what I finally figured out, I checked some things around and knew there was such a thing as stray voltage, but nobody had it in our area. I'd read about it in the magazine. But here they were getting shocked. So I called the Wadsworth Fire Department, or electrical guys, and they came out and looked at it and then sent some fellows out and got to talking and whatever, but we couldn't figure out where the voltage was coming from because they'd come out and test it during the day and nothing would happen. And I said, well, it does, you know, does uh, in the morning and, and in the evening, late. And so what it was, we figured out, was when it was dark, they were getting shocked. So they thought it was, had to be somebody, people getting up in the morning and showering and flushing the toilet and whatever, and somehow it was getting up to our parlor. And he said, well, the... the voltage the stray voltage when when you get a short in the electric somewhere it seeks the closest ground and the best ground and you got a, this double four milk parlor and all your, your you got wiring here and rod and it's, this is the best ground in the system so it's coming here and he said you're on the end you're on the end of the thing I'm on top of the hill there across from Tav Tav was it Tavanello? Up, up the road from Tavanello, half a mile. He said, well, it's got to be here. So they went from Wadsworth all the way out to my place looking for that ground, and all of a sudden it was gone. And they couldn't figure it out. And then the next day, I'd same thing. And they'd go out and they'd check these, they checked every house all the way from Wadsworth out to the top of that hill looking for that and couldn't find it. I don't know what it's going to do. Cows all got mastitis, milk chuck went to zero. Zero. I'm surprised it didn't charge me, but it went to zero. There was nothing in the tank. And they came out and tested the wires and all that. And the fellow from Wadsworth, the head head guy, says, told me he's a Christian. I said, I appreciate that. And he said, I feel so far sorry for you. He said, I've been praying for you. And... I asked the Lord, show me, show me. And the Lord says, the neighbor's light post. I thought, what? He said, so I came out, we came out with a uh, step ladder and climbed up. There was no, the milkers came on, everything was fine, cows weren't getting shocked, there was nothing in the parlor. And so he said, I just said, well, there ain't nothing, nothing there. And I went home, and he said, and the Lord woke me up in the night and said, you didn't, didn't do it right. He said, you took that ladder up, and I shook the short apart. He says, take, take a bucket truck out there. So he did. He said, his superior said, man, you're nuts. You're putting too much time in this. And he said, no, nah, I prayed. So I went out, and instead of taking the ladder up there, I got in the bucket truck and I put it on there, and shoot, man, it sparks everywhere. He said, so I f we found it. And they went out there the next day and fixed it, and that was the end of the straight voltage. And so I was the first guy to have straight voltage. 
in Ohio. In Ohio. They called the supervisor of the electric department from Wadsworth to speak in Columbus about what he found out because they were having other problems in the state. And he said, I told him, he said, the first thing you got to do is pray. He said, I hadn't humbled myself enough and it was a simple thing like that light. But that was, he said he, he didn't expect it because it was so far out from Wadsworth and through all these other places and yet it jumped those two wires. There's enough heat on there. He said, and they, they're, I don't know if they still do it, but at that time you rented that light and from the city. And the city has, has it hooked up direct. That's why there's so much juice on there. So once they found that out and they reported that, and I lost, I lost everything. It was so bad. My mom, our diet got so bad, she lost all her teeth. I mean, it was bad, bad, bad. And I was, we were still pouring concrete, so we had some income. Hadn't been for that, I'd have been belly up. But the fellow from Washington then came out, uh, Norm Bragg, he just retired. It's all in the paper. He's my age. He came out and said, well, you know, they gave me all the reports and showed me everything, and that light, said, they rented that light. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, they rent that light off the city of Wadsworth. He said, so that makes us responsible for the problem, not them. He said, and we're willing to settle for a million dollars. Give a million dollar check right now. Wow. He said, because we know you could probably get five to ten million. He said, but straight up, I said, we, you, you'd have to sue us. He said, you'd have to go through that. I can't just give you a million dollars, but I I'll, I'll, won't fight it. We'll, we'll agree to it. And I told him, I said, no, I said, I'm, I'm a born-again Christian, and our church teaches not to sue and use lawsuits. And I said, so, no, I, I wouldn't sue you. He couldn't believe it, but I, I told him, no, I couldn't do it, so I didn't sue him. And then I took all the crap from my debt. I had tons of debt, you know, but I, I, with the Lord's help, I said, well, he saved me, and he showed this fella here, I'll get this. I just kept on shoveling, and I kept at it, and finally got up on top of it, and things were going. The cows were doing good, farmers doing good, and the Mennonite fellow lived down the road from me. Wanted to start farming. And he said, hey, he said, somebody said you were tired of milk and you're thinking about selling your cows. Would you sell them to me? And I said, you put a price on them and you got them. So he brought some brethren down from the church and they went through and they were gone. I said, thank you, Lord. Didn't have to milk cows anymore. But, I, but the head up in the middle, that bison right there on the skull, his name was Major. And I bought his herd. He only had three left. He had had hundreds, but he sold them. I had three left. He he actually had called me on the phone and asked me to. I started tanning hides. I built a cabin up there, and I started tanning hides. Some of these are, hides are out of there. And uh, he saw us tanning hides and called me and said, "I'm going to kill some bison for the hunt club. Would you be interested in tanning hides for me?" And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd do that. So I tanned the hides, and we would never tasted the meat. But he, you know, he told me how good it was and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know anything about bison. Means so I'll get out. But this is one of those three he had. And he, I bought those bison off of him. He actually went to Arizona on a trip. He wanted to see his sister out there or something. So he asked me if I'd do the chores out at his farm out near Cloverleaf High School. I said, yeah, I'd do that. So I went out and did the chores for the bison. So I got to know him, and there were more than three there then, but I got to know him a little bit, and I knew he was going to kill them all. And I tanned those three hides for him, and he loved those hides. And he called me on the phone, and he said, uh, you like those bison? I said, yeah, I really like them. He said, uh, they're yours. He said, well, I'll make a deal with you when I get home, but if you want them, they're yours. So that's how I got in the bison business. Went out and got those, and I remember I, I got the first ones, and I loaded from him, and I loaded them on the back of the trailer, 
and I just bought a new trailer. And the first bison that went in threw his head up, put his horns right through the top of that trailer, and I thought, whoa, we said, I told you they're, they're wild. And said, yeah, they're wild. But that was the first one. I got that one home, and man, the meat was just fantastic. You know, the children, Seth was sitting in a high chair. He was 10. He was 10. Yeah, he was in a high chair. Yeah, he was 10. But he tasted that bison. Bunny didn't tell him it was bison. She made meatballs, right? Boy, he said, Mommy said, that's the best meat I've ever eaten. So that was, that was sealed it for us. I called Willard Stevenson, and I said, hey, I'll, I'll take the rest of that herd. So I did. And he taught me everything he knew. That's how I learned all of them, you know. But boy, they were wild bison. They were wild. Our father founded the company in uh, 1993, 1994, and that, that became uh, the family business. Sean, his history was really not really anything to do with butchering, aside from maybe hunting or whatever, a little bit of farm uh, butchery that our dad did. And um, my dad had a dairy farm and a concrete business. So when he, um, when he got into raising buffalo in the late 80s, he was having them butchered here. Uh, this is an established butcher shop and looked much the same that you see, and this, especially the, the area behind us, uh, same butcher boy saw um, the day that we would have walked into it in uh, 1993 or 1994. Hey, how you doing there, buddy? How you doing, Seth? Huh? This is a beef, <laughs> a junky beef. I won't mention the customer's name because that'll get it us in trouble with him. But this is Sean Perkins. He is quality control manager in charge of our HACCP program, just about everything else, putting up with everything from the inspectors. This is Seth Perkins right here. He's the head meat cutter. He's the man who cuts it up, puts it in the package. Hey, Seth, front and center. How you doing there, buddy? All right, huh? Peace there, brother. So that's the meat saw. The beef comes out of that little cooler right there. And like I said, this guy right here, Sean Perkins, he is the meat or the meat boner here. Fred. And in charge, yeah, it may seem Fred. This is Fred right here. So this is our processing floor. And as you can see, the meat gets cut up and put here, but Stacy's not there. That's her job. That's her cuber that she does her work on. We have a customer pulling in right now, so we'll zero in on him and see who it is. I don't know. So we'll back off, but this is our retail area. That's the door that goes into our retail area. There is our counter. There is my barbershop sign right there. If you need a haircut, this is the place to come get it. So here it is. Goodbye. Here's Dad working outside right there. That's Pop. He's working away. He doesn't know I'm videoing him, so I got this up sideways here. So you can see him, but the door's heaved up. And uh, he is right outside of the deli area. If you remember our deli area. And he's over by the boxing room door. Now he's gone. There, there's a little bit of him. And he is trying to get that to thaw out. Hey, Pop. Hey, Dad. <laughs> Goodbye. Four. Hi, Scott. You don't have to duck down. And this is our kill floor area, our slaughter floor area. The animals come in here into the knocking box. This is the knocking box right here. And the animals are brought into here. We're gonna actually get some live footage here from one of the family. They're lifted up on that hoist and they are bled out into a barrel and they're laid down on these skinning carts and they are skinned out and they go from there and they hook up to that gambles right there. And that's my station. And that gambles is operated by a hoist up here and that's the hoist that operates it. And these rollers are put up to hang the beef sides on. And this is our kill floor. I'm in the locker room. And this is the kill floor. Lockers, men's bathroom, stairs that go up to the inspector's office, out to the smokehouse. And here is Scotty. Say hello, Scotty, how you doing? Here, let me see, how you doing there, buddy? How you doing? All right, this guy's going to open up the cooler door and he's going to show us inside the cooler. There you go. These are the coolers. And 
long range shot will kind of show you that cooler is filled with beef and that cooler runs clear to the back of that wall plus out onto the kill floor open the door again scott i wasn't quite finished and it is a rather large cooler but there is the beef you can see how they hang oh leave it open scott you're hard on me here <laughs> it hangs by that those hooks you those hooks you saw out on the kill floor and that is a beef carcass those are barrels that we store our hams and bacons in so scotty thank you very much yes dad never sits in that chair i hear you I'm thank you very much all right now. thank you very much there's a white door so that is one of the cooler doors and that other cooler door opens up onto the processing floor which we filmed first so that's it processing floor again and there's the office girl stacy say hello hey say hello look over here let me see you there you go how you doing you're now nah, you're in the office and she works over at this table right there so we missed her in the processing there's sean i'll show you he dumps the burger by the lug full and then sean grinds it out and he's wondering why i'm not over here boning out this meat but i'm having such a great time i'm in the boxing room and dad is chipping away on the frozen ice out there. Kind of wanted to get a close up shot of Pop while he's working. He's walking away from me again. Well, this is a view out the front, the meat truck. Now I'm kind of shaking quite a bit. There he is. Wonderful man. God bless him. He works so hard. It's such a wonderful influence in my life. Let's move over here to the window. Kind of dirty, but we'll live with it. So there's Pop. Front of the deli area. This is our deli area. This is the front door right here where you come in. And this is my office, with my haircut sign. And cash register is here, counter. That's my office there. Pepsi machine. This is also another door right here and I have this smoke case in a meat sign uh, this is the bison meat case and there is a multitude of bison product in there you see the ground bison and the rest of the product so that is the bison case this is the deli case and then again here is the decoration and beef and pork case. It looks when you walk in the front door, cash register, counter, doors that lead into the processing room. It's kind of a glare on there, so I'm not sure how much we'll see through there uh, because of the sale barn. But this is the processing floor. Earlier, this is where Sean was standing boning. Sean's in there actually cleaning right now, but we probably have enough glare in there. We can't see a whole lot. But I thought I'd just stand down through here and just kind of show you. There's a log cabin that Seth built. Uh, this is the retail area from this side. So I was standing previously right there by the pork case. So we have Stolzfus jams and jellies and chicken and various products. So this is the inside of the deli area. And it should be stated, one of the big uh, opportunities for us to even be here today is just the fact that three of us can get along. Um, it wasn't the maybe it wasn't always that way. <laughs> I think it just says we got a little bit longer in the tooth. Yeah. We realized that you know it doesn't do any good to you know roll each other around on the floor or anything like that. Although that did happen I a few times. I think we eventually back in learned that if we continued, we were just going to end up killing each other. So which I'm ten years yeah. older than Seth, twelve years older than Scott. So yep, I'm the youngest. I'm 38. So uh, I I bring up the the and I'm I'm not only the youngest of the brothers, but we have three sisters. So. Um, which I have a twin, but I'm, I'm the actual uh, baby of the family, the dead last. And Sean got pretty used to us because we were the snotty-nosed kids that always rode with him to McDonald's and begged for ice cream cones. So um, when he was trying to hang out with his buddies, we were always the ones begging to go, yeah, right, I was, right uh, in the back seat of the car. I turned 16, got my license, 1986, six and four, their ages. Yeah. I remember uh, begging for an ice cream cone and 
some of my earliest memories, I got hurt all the time. I used to, uh, we had a big farm and, and I would get hurt and some of my earliest memories are Sean carrying me in from the barn or somewhere with, uh, you know, a need of stitches. But um, when our dad bought the company uh, in 93, 94, it was with the vision of making his uh, bison farm a, a, a name brand, uh, a, a household name, if you will. And he had a dream, he wanted to put a pack of hot dogs, bison hot dogs on every table in America. If you ask him, he would still say that. And um, with it came a established custom meat processing business. Um, the, uh, the former owner wanted to retire, so he sold the business to our dad. Our dad's intention was to uh, just produce bison meats with this facility, but it came with a custom meat processing business. So he, um, he continued that business. Um, at the time, it was beef and pork, maybe a few lambs that were custom butchered, and then of course our bison. So what we should touch on a little bit, as Scott mentioned, this, this was owned by a, you know, a previous owner when, when our father purchased it. Um, the first 10 to 15 years of being in this business were extremely difficult. Um, within the first year of purchasing this business, uh, the previous owner actually opened up another shop um, very close and it was a pretty difficult time for our family financially. It was rough. So we, uh, you know, it was the grit and determination that got us through because we, we nearly went bankrupt through, the, through those years. Um, but we did, at the time, we didn't, you know, there was a lot of frustration, a lot of uh, just a lot of resentment and things like that that were happening, but we didn't realize that it was potentially the best thing that could ever happen to us because uh, it gave us so much determination to want to succeed. Plus, you know, when you're down and out financially like that um, and things are so difficult, you can either quit or you can pull together as a team and push forward. And that's exactly what we did. Um, it just gave us so much determination to not want to fail. There yeah, our dad's it was, uh, high school coach always told him when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Mm -hmm. And it did get very tough. Yep. Um, but our, our faith, I'd like to attribute our, some of you know, our, our faith, keeping us 100%. where we needed to be, so. And there were two, there was actually two times where um, things got really tough. The first one was in 1995 mm -hmm. when um, the previous owner opened up that second shop, which was just two miles down the road. And he, um, he took a lot of the custom business work back to himself, which we then regained. Um, the, 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 the second time, if you will, was in 1998. Our dad had hired um, maybe three or four employees. Um, Sean was actually still, uh, he was working here part time, but he was still running the um, a concrete business because our family came out of Wadsworth, Ohio and had Perkins and uh, Sons Concrete since 1973. So Sean was running that portion of the business. Um, Seth and I, of course, were working here, but at our ages, 16 and 18, um, we were behind like the meat cutters and the things that, that our dad had hired. Well, in 1998, um, just south of us in Worcester, they, they opened up a super Walmart. So at the time, uh, Walmart was just, you know, home goods, and then they went into grocery, and then they put in a meat department. Um, well, our employees all got together and went to work at Walmart. Um, literally I remember, walked remember in here one in day here on yep. a Monday morning and we had nobody to cut meat. Yep. It was So the pressure let's figure this out. The pressure with custom processing is is your cooler's full. You've got carcasses hanging. You've got to get them processed through here. So now you can imagine we've got in 1995 the way that we dealt with uh, getting through those tough times was you know, we took all the work that we could get. So all the deer processing, we did uh, a ton of ostrich. At the time, ostrich was, uh, it was a popular uh, fad, if you will. We plucked, I mean, I remember till, till the skin was gone off my fingers, I would pluck ostrich and um, we, we did all that. So we kind of been through round one and now here's round two and we all had to step up to the plate. Yeah, I, got, I have three kids. My youngest is behind the camera. 
right there. And the day that he was born, we were cutting deer that day. Yep, and I, I, I remember. And I remember went and watched him be born, came right back, and we cut deer that day till 11 p.m., I think. Yeah, and mm. we're certainly not trying to you know throw a pity party or anything like that, but people want to know our history and how we got to where we're at. This is exactly what happened. So yep. um, the other thing we should probably touch on is that when in 1994, 1995, when um, the previous owner opened a shop up uh, right down the street, it nearly sunk us. And dad had no other choice but to bring us in as full-time employees. Uh, Scott was 12 years old, 11, 12, I mm -hmm. was 13, 14. Um, Sean was 10 years older. But um, we were both going to uh, a local school, church school, and we quit. Quit going to school and started working. Scott has five years of education. I've got seven. Sean's got 10. That's why we think he should be uh, th the smartest out of all three of us. But, <laughs> but no, we- And the best looking. <laughs> we, uh, dad said, look guys, <clears throat> I need your help in the shop. This is how we're gonna get through. And um, we quit school. Yeah, we I made just- it, We uh, immediately started working. I think it was 94 or five, somewhere right in there. I had just taken over the family construction business on my own. Uh, my grandpa was, uh, who was heavily involved with my dad in 73, obviously, and those two were in business together, stayed on with me. Um, he was in his early 70s. He did a lot of the estimating and stuff like that, and I was fully prepared to take it over. Uh, ran it successfully for a year, and I remember, still remember the day, standing out here on the farm, loading up a piece of equipment, and dad said, I, I need some help. I, we don't have any help. I got, we have all this work to do, and I got nobody to do it so after you know a lot of contemplating or whatever just kind of stepped in here in the business and obviously these guys know more about the actual meat cutting than I do as far as you know getting it off the animal they're a little more experienced because of that but that's what had to happen so I always remember dad telling us that he was building this business as a future for for his children which was us at the time when we were so young, you know, that's all we were thinking about was bonfires in the weekend. Um, we didn't yeah, really. I got here to work a lot of times, and they were uh, they <laughs> we were can still leave, out. Can we leave that part out. Sean. Yeah, we we we, uh, we had our rowdy days. for We sure. had a coming of age. We did. Those, yeah. those didn't create some very good brotherly moments. <laughs> no, but um, Dad always said that he was building this business for our future, and we didn't really understand that until maybe the last, you know, within the last ten years or so, because. Now we realize that the, the foundation that's been built that we can pass down to our kids is, you know, the, the gift throughout this whole thing. It's just, it's incredible. Actually, I'm making an instructional video. Uh, that's something <laughs> not supposed to do. Going back to 1998, going back to the Saul, going back to the employees all walking out the same weekend, um, we did have the opportunity to spend a few years underneath of those guys. They were a lot of old school butchers. They had been around a lot of places, so they knew all the butchering techniques. That's where we learned. So um, we're thankful that we did have a few years to, to train under those guys. A lot of people want to know, you know, where we learned how to butcher. It was simply by working with them. Um, Osmosis. Yeah, we didn't go yep, to yep. college uh, meat science to nope. do this. It's fly by the seat of your pants. No, no meat science, cutting degrees, anything like that. It's literally, you know, get a job next to an old school butcher, learn the trade, and boom. We became absolutely one of the best custom slaughter operations in this area. Yep, we, um, so that cross, really- Cross your T's, dot your I's. Yeah, so That's that, what was ingrained in us by our old man. Doctor, well, doctor. Right, yes. with our father being a military guy, he had um, implemented, implemented different procedures that we used so that when an order went through, a custom order went through, um, we, we dropped our, or eliminated mistakes down to virtually zero. And like Sean said, we became the name that was synonymous with uh, quality custom butchering in, in uh, basically the whole state. And we had people, we were USDA, so we'd have people that would travel from out of state and 
Um, it, our, our resolve had, had really strengthened so much through those tough years that, um, you know, as we grew a little bit older, we became a little bit more responsible. Um, Sean didn't find himself in here wondering <laughs> if we were <laughs> going to make it in. There was um, times that we probably came straight to work. There wherever, was a few times. I think I still get here every day before them, though. Still. He does. I mean, he yeah. still flips the lights on. Um, just a great uh, quality. And, and, our, and our father and that our was just grand... just part of growing up, though. Yeah. yeah. Our father yeah. and grandfather had taught us some incredible work ethic um, just because we grew up on a farm and then going through the, um, the concrete, uh, concrete construction yeah. taught us that, you know, when... when you're going through the you know, pouring concrete, for example. You you have to be able to hustle and turn it on and things like with that. With dad so, being a with dad being a drill sergeant, well, there was no. Yeah. It was you had a boot right up your butt yeah. the whole time. I remember Grandpa telling me when I was 15, 16, I got my license, and it was my responsibility to get to the job on my own. I remember him saying, "When I want you here, when I say I want you here at seven, that means you're standing here at seven, ready to go to work." That means you show up here at 6.30, you get your concrete boots on, and you get a shovel in your hand, and you're ready to go work at 7. That's how we were raised. So we had our grandfather um, on our dad's side, straight blue collar, worked World, with his hands. World War II. Yep. Um, our, our dad, uh, you know, he's got, he's one of those guys that, you know, has that tick, that little bit of a wild, um, you find it in the entrepreneur world where they just, they have no quit in them. And then our grandfather on our mom's side was um, straight-laced businessman, um, taught us some of those values, or we, we, we got some of those values. But um, you shake a man's hand, you shake it hard, and you look him right in the eyeball. Yep. That's what he taught us. So um, here we are, you know, our father. Now, the White Feather name came from our parents starting the bison business um, in, the, in the mid to late 80s. And they named the bison business White Feather Bison Company. And the reason they did that is our family migrated from uh, Pennsylvania into southern Ohio in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And they ran a trading post down there. And as a symbol of peace and friendship, the Native Americans gave them a white feather that you put over your cabin door. And, um, and, and that symbol said that you were friendly with the Native tribes and they did a lot of Native, uh, a lot of trading. So. Um, they, they, were, they were getting in the bison business and they wanted to do um, something symbolic of the friendship and the peace and that tied in with the pioneer heritage. So they named the business White Feather Bison Company. Um, in 1994, when our father grew into the meat business, or in other words, outside of the, just the bison business, White Feather Meats became the name of the business. Um, so that's where the name White Feather came from. Um, a sign of sim a symbol of peace and um, friendship and that's what uh, that's what we put on our business still to this day so you know as the years are progressing um, Sean had a family he had little kids which makes things even tougher that we learned because as um, as we grew into a um, you know we, we essentially what happened was we created this crushing custom business in the sense where people came to us because we were going to, with Seth's cutting style and all the procedures and the cleanliness and things that we had in place, being a USDA processor, we were pulling in work, like I said, from, from the whole state or a tri-state area. And our schedule was filled up to a year. So at this point, I'm kind of med managing the schedule. Um, we're talking the early 2000s. Um, again, more of a tough time for our family. Unfortunately, we lost a sister to cancer in 2001. Um, to see our parents go through that, just another one of those hardships, those battles that we went through. Um, and again, strengthen the resolve <laughs> that the family had. And this business is a really tough business. It'll wear you down. Yeah, it's hard. It'll wear you down um, just with the sense of, you know, it's dangerous. Um, we don't like to talk about them often, but I had a pretty severe accident where I had my teeth kicked in um, by a by beef cow when I was 15 years old. Uh, of course, we've all had cuts and things like that. Um, but yeah, and then you just have the, the nature of the work where we're, we're coming in here, you know, it was nothing. I mean, Sean said when Spencer was born, it was, uh, you were born at like 9, 10 p.m. And yeah. he went home, because you were born at home, he goes across the street, and then he comes back and we have to clean up. So we would work 
it wasn't unusual for us to work till till you know eleven midnight and then get up had, at four in the morning. Like, I think we had like forty or fifty deer to cut that day. Yeah. yeah. So we and and that's when we talk about Good the timing, Spencer. <laughs> the point of entry into this business is so tough because you have. Um, Which Spencer's twenty now, so that was twenty years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So and we're doing all this because of the financial hardships that we had had. You know, our father had mortgaged the place. Um, you've got to produce income, or else you're you're literally gonna you're, you're gonna have it taken from you. It was our family livelihood, but we started to gain just a little bit of traction. But at the cost of just being here, I mean, oh, yeah, to, bunch to of hours. 80, 80 hours a my, week, no my question. Wife works here full time now, currently. She stepped in when our girls, two girls, I have two girls, both married. Um, they were very young. Um, they started working in here when they were 12, 13 years old. Scott and Seth's kids have worked in here, you know, young ages starting. But also, we have some sisters that haven't been mentioned. They've played a big role mm -hmm. too in what you know took place in the last, you know, early '90s, yep. and even up till now. Our yeah. older sister Shannon um, moved, lives out of state now, but she was really instrumental in, in the bison business and getting that established. And then our sister Stacy has worked along our side um, the whole time. Um, and so, when Stacy comes in to work, you know that everything's going to be good because she can handle any position in here, whether it's talking to a customer, or answering the phone, packaging meat. When Stacy shows up, she's like a little mouse, yeah. just scurries <laughs> she's around, just, waits on customers, Stacey's, answer the phone, oh hey, put this meat in the package. stacy has got it handled. Yeah. And you know, another another person that's been extremely instrumental to us has been our mother. Because oh, yeah. oh yeah. If if it hadn't been the the our mother holding the glue together on this whole thing, she truly she is a saint. We had Plus plenty she had to, of an emotional, mental breakdowns saint. in this yeah. process. Yeah, because I mean, even talking about you know the pressure of the financial pressure and the amount of workload, and I think we've all probably quit a couple times. Yeah, um, I maybe more than you guys, yeah. but uh, I remember you know slamming the door, getting in your pickup truck, squealing out the driveway, saying I'm never coming back, you know whatever. And then you find yourself an hour later after you've settled down, went around the block a few times, cut meat again, pulling back in the driveway, and you're right behind us all cutting meat again because you just, it's all we know. Well, and we just, were, and we loved it. We were it taught really, that yeah. um, united we stand, divided we fall. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've stuck together, and, and that has a lot to do with our Christian faith. And, and just um, like Sean said, you know, you peel out of here and then you just go around the block and you come <laughs> back and you start cutting meat again. Um, so that hasn't happened in a the, really long time. It, ha it has no, not. Yeah, happened. we've matured. Thank I think God. that has. A lot <laughs> I'm 51, so I don't yeah. even have the fortitude to fight with anybody. So yeah. the, Perg the Perkins blood is um, a bunch of hotheads. Yeah, because yeah. our, our, our we're grand, Irish. Our so grandmother we was a McConnell, so we, we kind of get that. They're all fired up. Um, just firing little suckers. Yeah, <laughs> you get that. You get that hot head going, and it's all down. So the blessings right. that we drew from that. Um, from, from all those tough times were that, um, well, number one, we learned everything front to back because we literally started with the toughest jobs in the building from the hides and the guts and the things that, that nobody wants to do. Like Seth said, we were working under the, um, the other old school butchers. But as we, as we um, graduated, if you will, up through the ranks, um, we still, of course, knew those jobs, but we started to, like I said, just became synonymous with the best place to bring your animals. Um, so our schedule gets booked out. In the early 2000s, we're starting to gain uh, a lot more traction just in the sense of like, you know, all those things that we had fought for are uh, gelling together. So at that point, you know, Seth and I each marry our wives. Um, Which by the way, we've got some off, awesome, awesome wives because like Sean mentioned, his wife, Laura works here, Spencer's mother. Um, Scott's married to Jamie, my wife's Alicia. Um, they've been through a lot because yeah. as a business owner, yeah. it, our attention is just like you might always, get always on work. Well, we were dumb so, enough too. The three of us were on the local fire department as volunteers. It's like we were working in here 80 hours a week and then you'd get an all night fire call and then we'd be gone all night. I, rem I remember peeling out of the house you know, all the time, like even on a Christmas day, and I didn't even, get, didn't even spend the time with my kids that I probably should have. And there's just, we just had a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, they, so they've definitely put up with a lot, um, you know, whether it be spending a lot of time at work, building a brand, 
I mean, just countless hours, you know, answering messages on your phone, emails, doing all that stuff. So kudos to them. It was at this time that our um, dad had kind of said that he wanted to take a more of a backseat role and he um, pushed the business on to the three of us more and more. And uh, that's kind of hunting a lot. That's that's kind of where our cabin <laughs> yeah. in Southern Ohio came in, where he uh, bought some property in Southern Ohio. Of course, these were never things that we could do when you know those 10, 15 years where we we just didn't have the opportunity. So he buys that property and then wants to put up a log cabin. This is about 2005. Which so he started can, to disappear can, a lot. You can refer to another video on our channel of the actual cabin build. So if anybody wants to see it, it's pretty cool. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Like 2005, our dad built this log cabin. That's our hunting property, um, and we've kind of really got a, you know, got the wheels greased, I guess you will, on the bison or on, excuse me, on the custom business. Still doing the bison. The bison is absolutely the cornerstone of our business. At no point throughout the the, the start of the uh, you know the 85, 86 bison uh venture until today has there ever not been bison on our farm yeah we still raise them sean manages all that um, we, we still don't farm we still raise the crops to feed the bison people all the time are like how's come i wear flannel shirts and wear sean's the farmer he's yep i'm the farmer in the family i just it's way 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 down in there and i can't get rid of it so these guys i mean they'll help too but they're not as much into it Yep. So um, Seth and I then, you know, we had met our wives and we were starting families and then we learned, you know, just how difficult Sean had it when you have the little kids and, you know, don't sleep at night and kiss the kids and all yeah. that stuff. And then you're coming in here because, like I said, when you have that that custom uh, schedule, your slave. Yep. You've got it scheduled. It's the work's coming to you. Um, you can't turn the valve off. It's Once just it's wash, in the cooler, rinse, repeat over and over and you're over just, again. Yep. So you only gain a little bit at a time in that business too, um, just in terms of the amount of work and what you're bringing in and income. But we were gaining, we were gaining ground. So as we move through into the um, 2005 to 2015, and that's right when we were crazy enough that uh, dad being a Vietnam vet, we all know that they can, you know, it's got some wild ideas. Um, we decided to get our pilot's license. We did so that do that. That was a good idea. Not this guy. So, so um, in the midst of all that. Well, that was a dream of our dad. Oh, he yeah. was 59. He was like, I, I'm not getting any younger. Yeah. He always wanted to be a helicopter pilot in uh, Vietnam. And he didn't. He just he left and started working instead. Um, so it was always a dream. So Scott and dad <laughs> and I all went to local airport, got our pilot's license, and we started flying down to our hunting property. And uh, we still carry our, hunt our, uh, our private pilot's license. We just don't fly as much as we wish we had. But... Anyway, cool, yeah, cool little history. Give me a John Deere with a field. Yeah. <laughs> Sean stays firmly planted on the ground. We go in the air. Um, so we, to meet the demand for the custom, uh, and keep, keep in mind, we've got a retail store that we're kind of slowly expanding. And by expanding, I mean, we just literally kept putting another meat case in every corner <laughs> of the retail store till we literally ran out of real estate. And I'll get to that in a minute, but 2010 we're kind of seeing like boy we're the works there um we're we're still family you know all family or whatever and um so we went about hiring some more butchers um hiring and training and if uh that's that's a six month process just to get somebody just fresh that's never experienced it to even maybe get you a little bit of return on your money especially when you're going from start to finish so all the way through training how the slaughter floor um through you know every every that's a, every step of the process slaughter's a grind that's yeah. a great point and maybe we had forgot because it had been you know a 15 year gradual pattern where we had learned to slaughter bison beef pork lamb goat uh ostrich elk, elk. and we knew these processes from the very slaughter step all the way through the final process and package and so we maybe weren't the best teachers either because we we had just we had I think we expect learn, learned expected more a lot than we even people. knew mm -hmm. so but yeah you're talking about a six month before you even kind of start to get somebody going and a year before you're really even kind of getting and then you know but the truth of the matter is none of them could hang it just they couldn't hang and maybe it was because we were already to a advanced stage but um you know you're asking somebody 
50 hour a week minimum. Your hands are going to be cramping up. Your back's going to be cramping up. You're going to be You're I mean, standing that, all day. That slaughter floor is a, it's it's a, it's a man breaker. And we also understand that, um, you know, there was more in it for us, obviously, because we were owners of the company at that point. Um, so, you know, we kind of there was a, a reward at yep. the end of the day. And for those guys, you know, they, they just they didn't have that same feeling. So. Um, yeah, it, it, that's it a great tough. point. Yeah. Our parents had made us partners as Kudos to our parents. Yep, for yeah. as um, to come on board. Yep. So our it was, sweat, sweat equity bought us um, uh, ownership roles in the business. We saw that that we just we, we weren't going to be able to sustain this pace, um, even though we tried. And so we, um, when, whenever we found that the butchers that we were training just couldn't stick with us, and, and that we weren't going to. Um, we just basically weren't going to be able to get enough people in the building to sustain the work. We decided that we were going to change our business model. So in 2015 was our last year that we had a full custom slaughter schedule. In other words, we were taking phone calls and putting animals on the schedule for people that, um, you know, that we didn't own the animal. And that was right when we were transitioning into building the, and starting the brand. Right, so that's where the so Beard of thir- Butcher brand. 13, 14 is when we started dabbling in the in the brand. Yep, so. And it was because of one of the guys, well, actually two of the guys that worked here, um, Craig Noletti and Daniel Berger. We uh, we actually, we started a, a beard growing contest. And is it okay to talk about the, I think was, you should like, bring it in. Yeah, yeah. because I, would, I was gonna loop back to that, but that's there's no like, reason not to bring it in right now. Right when we started it, because um, those guys were working here, and just for something fun to kind of get our minds off of work, we decided to create a beard club and we had a beard growing contest. So we actually started one morning, I started a Facebook group called the Northeast Ohio Facial Hair Club. We started having meetings, um, just something fun to get a bunch of guys together, grow your beards out, see how long you could last. I think we made it at about 12, I didn't last long. 12, 12 months or so before we, uh, before we trim. But interesting is um, that during that time period is when it was actually my wife, Alicia, her mother had a, uh, a recipe for a spice and um, I really liked it. So when we were dating, she used to make like chicken wings and grilled cheese sandwiches and stuff. And I would go over and I'd, I'd love the spice. So she's like, hey, you know, do you want to do something with it? So I got a hold of it and tweaked the recipe a little bit. There was some ingredients in it that I wanted to remove because we, we felt that there was a need for a, a, a healthy spice in this industry. Um, at the time, everything was about sugar and anti-caking agents and just all kinds of fillers and um, you know not clean ingredients. So um, we we started mixing. You know, I'd order five pounds of this and five pounds of that and get these these spices together and blend them, um, and then you know removing the sugar, removing the anti-caking agents and all that stuff. Um, but literally, you know, in our break room, mixing these spices together and people would start coming in the store and we knew they were going to be making a brisket or pulled pork or something for the weekend so we're like hey you know give this a try well they started coming back and they're like hey you got any more of that spice and and for a while we didn't even sell it it was just one of those deals where we had these containers that we used to put slices of liver in during our custom processing and we would just give somebody a container of spices so we did that for probably what maybe 12 months so we i think that was about 12 months Probably 2010, yeah. 2011, in that time frame when you were making hand making it or whatever. Right, and, and then, then it was about 2012 when we started. We decided to brand it. And yeah, so and kind of that cliche: you should bottle and sell this stuff. Yeah, and because it was the demand was there. And one thing about being in this business, especially in the custom processing business, is you have a lot of time to think and talk mm-hmm. because you're all standing around. You know, when the when the saws shut off. Um, you're all standing around the boating table and we talk about stuff. So we're like, well, we need a name for this, for this spice. And so it, you know, and it, and it uh, went right along with our, um, at the time period of our beard club. So we were like, all right, well, let's, um, let's, let's call it Beard Butcher Approved. And we, we dubbed ourselves the Beard Butchers based off of our new group. Our beard growing our, prowess at the time. Exactly. Well, then we we're like, all right, well, Beard of Butcher approved. Let's use Dad as our the face of our logo. The original Beard of Butcher. The original Beard of Butcher, because growing up, Dad always had a beard. He uh, got out of Vietnam. He had to obviously stay trimmed 
um, during, in the Army. So when he got out, immediately grew a beard, and we always knew him with a beard. Grandfather had a beard. Um, so we just thought that was fitting, call it, you know, call ourselves the Beard Butchers. Um, so from there, it went from Beard of Butcher Approved to Beard of Butcher Blend Seasoning um, to the Beard of Butchers. And then it just, it all happened really, really fast. Because at the time, we were discontinuing things like deer processing. So we didn't want to discontinue something and just drop it because dad, dad, one thing dad always taught us was to always be thinking about the future. And we were like, okay, well, if we have this knowledge and this skill, why not pass that on to, to our audience? Um, and teach people how to do this at home. At the time, obviously we didn't have a very large audience, but we had a Facebook following and things like that. So um, we were like, okay, let's take the knowledge that we have, especially in wild game processing, et cetera, and we're gonna go to our local sporting goods store. And we're gonna teach people in person how to get their hands on this, this we, we use the white tail deer, how to get their hands on the deer and we're gonna teach them how to process it. Well, it just so happened that the weekend we were scheduled to do what was called an Eat Wild at our local Fin Feather and Fur Sporting Goods store, uh, they said that uh, the weather was gonna be warm and et cetera, some things fell through and they couldn't make that possible. So um, I had shot a deer and it had hung for you know three or four days in the cooler. I told Scott, I was like, hey, grab my cell phone, let's video this thing and we'll put it on Facebook. So we did like a 20, 25 minute video, how to process a deer. Hi folks, hey guys. Seth, per Seth Perkins, Scott Perkins. Um, Seth's got a deer here he harvested, so we're gonna get started, show you guys how to cut it up. First of all, tagging, extremely, extremely important. Immediately it kind of blew up. It was up. just one take. One take. Wasn't even holding the camera horizontal. Terrible, terrible quality footage, you know, whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> so we threw it on Facebook and then I checked it like a few weeks later and it had like over half a million views. And I was like, wow, you know, this, there's an audience for this. So it was that point that we created our YouTube channel and Scott created a URL, uploaded it to, uh, downloaded the video to the computer from Facebook and then uploaded it onto YouTube. And that was the very first video that we filmed um, that, that really sparked the YouTube channel. But looking back, we had no idea that, you know, starting with a spice, starting the beard club, coming up with the name to creating the videos would lead us to where we're at. Which we, people but, ask all the time, how's come I'm never on camera or whatever. And our great grandpa, and our grandpa were very quiet, and I just got those jeans, I guess. And I did. I'm just not a. <laughs> we kind of not a in the front of the camera guy. We, I'm a, and that's in, great. Yeah, I'm out in the we, field kind of guy. We, he he, has, a, him, he so. has a role that he fulfills very well that we certainly couldn't do without. He's our maintenance guy too. Yep. So if he's if he's not on camera, that just means he's fixing. Something. A lot of times when these guys do videos, I'm farming or doing something like that so that's the only reason why you're not seeing me the last one you were grinding something in the shop and somebody commented is somebody singing in the background <laughs> so yeah. anyway um 2015 and just some of the business side of it so i had been kind of managing some of the you know the schedule and things like that we're growing our retail um and i have more of an interest in the business things probably get it from my grandpa fellows but he's um, a tight wad <laughs> Yes, so I do keep the money. <laughs> I do keep the purse strings tied pretty tightly. But anyway, um, all these Seth things. And I are spenders. <laughs> yeah, the things that we learned back in the uh, in the early days. So we're 2015. We've got the thing, you know, the spice and things are going. Whatever. Just um, just starting though. I mean, yeah. just starting. Yeah, to get the it ball was rolling. certainly not like you know you couldn't build a business around it. No, for sure. But God had a plan, and that's something that Seth. Um, alluded to a little bit with just kind of looking back now and that's always great when we look back and we're like man God had a plan for all of this so 25th time we had no idea yeah I mean well, it's just yeah and our dad had given us more of um, you know more response or virtually all the responsibility in the business because he had stepped out and he's hunting a lot but it was really just here's the custom business it's kind of a like Seth said wash rinse repeat so you're on the hamster wheel um, not a lot you can do with that. 
So um, and it's he real. Was, it's real competitive. It is so very competitive. In, in our Somebody's area, a nickel cheaper than you. They go to them. Yeah, it might even be petty. It is a little bit. Yeah. And so, as far as like actually making a lot of money doing it, there just really isn't a chance there because it's it's you're working for pennies. Yeah. So volume's the key. But yeah. anyway, um, so 2015, we just pretty much ended our custom schedule. We didn't really tell him. He was not happy when he when Those <laughs> March of or excuse me January, January of 2016 five when years ago. he said why are why are you know why aren't you rolling why isn't the kill you know and it's like dad this is a new you know direction or whatever those were pretty tough again because it was a tough it took few a, months yeah, it, it was but tough. but we were at the point physically and and emotionally mentally where we were just <clears throat> nearly burnout yeah. on on just and we certainly can't blame the butchers that we hired that couldn't hang with this mm -hmm. because we were we were like seth said we had vested interests and we could barely do it so for some and we we gained a lot of um knowledge and and some of the ideas that that helped launch our beer to butcher brand came from them um in fact uh one of them still works for us and, and manages inventory and product but in 2016, we're like, we better do something to pick up this revenue. So let's really, let's just double down, let's leverage this beer to butcher brand that we're doing and um, see what we can do with it. And we knew we wanted to build our retail, our brick and mortar out as well, but let's, let's get more involved with the videos, the spice, the online, the e-commerce. So we, um, we developed, we spent that year developing um, a different spice for each brother. Um, we had the, the blend, um, and so we named we it original. Dad. Yep, put dad on the label. And then we did um, Chipotle because it's cool and smoky, kind of like Sean. It's got a little bit of that 80s vibe. 80s um, baby. Yep, so we did the, the we were, Chipotle. We were, we were gonna come up with a salt and pepper blend for him for the- Although for, I was born in 1970, but the 80s were, were pretty cool. Yeah. This is golden era. Seth, the Cajun blend, a little bit, you know, a little bit wild, um, a little mouthy, a little bit, uh, a little nose. crazy. <laughs> and just to describe the flavor profiles, original, great, mild, all-purpose seasoning goes on anything. That's how we formulated it. Sean's with the cool and smoky, still mild. It's great on things like French fries and popcorn and grilled cheeses and chicken and not just not red meat. Not super hot, not spicy. Yep, Seth's got the multi-peppered uh, uh, little back of the throat burn. It's uh, great on seafood and fish and um and then hot because i have a red beard we just put mine on the Come on hot, hot. Yeah. a little bit hot goes from zero to 100 and fly too close to the sun sometimes but anyway yeah. so then we had the four blends and um so we were doing like seth said we did the um we kind of did some sportsman show type stuff we did uh rib festivals things to kind of start so here we are you know almost in a way Jump starting a brand or a business, and we're, we're we have to get on our bike and pedal again. You're back to 99. Yep. So you have you know maybe a little bit more. You know we 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 took a financial risk, chopped off revenue on the custom meat processing side. So let's pick it up on the uh, this new brand side. One thing we didn't want to do though was we weren't looking for investors. No. So throughout you know creating this brand, um, initially right off the bat we trademarked everything. So there was a lot of money, you know, legal stuff that had to be spent there to trademark our brand. So in the United States, literally like almost everything you can think of is trademarked to Beard and Butcher. So if you're thinking about it, yeah. don't even don't try. Don't use the Beard and Butcher. So, uh, yeah. So Scott being more on the financial side, he can explain this better, but we always, um, you know, we use profit out of the white feather side to feed the Beard and Butcher side to build that brand. But um, that's one thing we wanted that was important to us is to, um, build it ourselves. You know, we're a 100% family owned. There's no outside source of income, um, no investors. Uh, it's American, no shark tank here. American dream, right? It is the American dream and it came with a tremendous amount of hard work, but we again have to attribute it to our faith and God's grace because you put all those together well, without, and you can without, certainly go places. Without, you know, God's grace and our, and our faith, we, we wouldn't even been able to get along to the point. Not where long we, enough to get not, to where we're at no. now. So 20, um, by the end of 2016, things were looking a lot brighter. Our dad had eased up on us as he started to see this more of this vision. 
And um, again, we were wanting to do more videos and, and as we put those out on YouTube, we, we had a, an audience that was receiving those well. So here we, like Seth said, not only can we leverage the financial capital of our, our meat business, but we can leverage all the authenticity and all the, all the knowledge and the experience that, that we have, we can leverage that to help build our brand. So um, as, as we get into 2017 and even 2018, um, we're gaining more popularity as the Beard of Butcher brand. You know, once you get your name out there, I built a website, we're starting to sell the spices online. So the, the thing you do have to remember is that when Scott says he built a website, it was, he built a website prior to the day's production. So this was spent, you know, in the mornings between the hours of five and 6 a.m. or between the hours of 5.30 to 6.30, 8.30, 9.30 p.m. because we had a block of time in the middle of the day that was spent you know, on production for our retail. So this whole, this whole thing was built almost you know, on the side of our full-time business. It certainly was a, a side hustle. And like Seth said, really no um, formal education in the sense where you had <clears throat> anybody teaching you. We you just learn to be scrappy, especially when you don't have a lot of money to work with <clears throat> or any money. So we go into um, like our store and we really are getting, a, so we now we're not focused on custom processing. And, and previously when we were cutting meat for our store, it always seemed to bookend our custom processing. Got to get it done before or after. Rob, and you never really, Paul, yeah, you never constantly. really had enough time to focus on your stuff. So we're focusing on our own meats for our store, our own brand. And um, it starts to really take off in the sense where more and more people are streaming into the store. Our store was tiny, um, literally like- People were standing outside the door waiting to get in because we were at what, 700, 800 square feet? Yeah, and, and it, it was, was mostly tiny, like tiny. freezer space and, and, and the building was designed to, to only really receive somebody to pay their custom processing bill and back out they go. We'd actually kind of encroached into a different area and build it out to put the meat cases in. We were out of room. Which by the way, we have a phenomenal customer base. Mom and dad have, we still have people shopping with us that shop with mom and dad at the original farm location, selling at meat out of our cabin back in the late 80s. So yeah. we've, we have customers that are you know 30 plus years old that have you know, shopped with us that long, they're still coming in our door. So well, we have generations now. Generations of customers. So our customer and our loyal customer base, um, we couldn't have done it without them. Yeah, they're either. still shopping for so, the same bison yeah. and then they walk through the doors. But we wanted to make a plan um, for a larger store and also more of a destination for people that are traveling as they're hearing about us. So 2018, we started plans again, not um, not using any outside money other than you know banks, but not no investments, um, no seed money, uh, uh, that that type of thing, no venture capitalist type stuff, no Kickstarter. So we go um, we go to the bank, we talk to them, and then you know I sit down and I write a, uh, another business plan that basically uh, you know demonstrates how we're going to make this work on paper, and which is then, hard to do because. How do you know your projection um, with a customer base? We knew it was growing, but to put that on paper, it's it's a swag. It, I mean, it is. Just, well, nobody knew the economy was going to shut down in 2020. It's a either. silly, wild yeah. arse guess because you just you don't know. Yeah. So you know, taking some of the historical data and putting it on paper and seeing where we're headed, and um, and then we we're super blessed because our my twin sister is married to um, a a member of a, of a construction company um, located just the next town over and they do um, great institutional um, and commercial, a commercial construction. Industrial. Yep, so we got with them and we started on a plan for a new, a new retail facade, but really a major overhaul in, in our business. So it's again a huge risk because you have the financial risk, but we had to work through that without interrupting our cash flow, which was the retail customer. So now Dad told us we could build a new store, but we could not, we could never close. Yeah. So we, we um, didn't never close, not for a single hour. Yeah. No. Our, our building, the portion that we're sitting in right now is literally a block hub. It was the very first structure 
and then everything was kind of <laughs> spoked out from there. So the hub and spoke construction, and we needed to strip it back to the hub. Well, in order to do so, we literally had to rip the whole front and side of the building off our existing store. Um, again, just by the grace of God, we used some decision-making to put an area of our uh, building that was just like a lean-to. We closed it in, insulated it, air-conditioned it, wired it, did all that stuff, and we took all of our meat cases. We moved into there. So the summer of 2019, uh, May through October, we were operating out of this uh, retail spot that was no bigger, no smaller really than what we had been in all this time, but it was literally kind of a, a warehouse portion. We had to get a temporary freezer and do all of these things um, and, and then uh, ask our customer to bear with us, and they did. And not only did they bear with us, but we, um, we again did a little bit better than, than the year before. So as we came into the end of 2019, uh, we finished our store. Simmons Brothers Construction did a phenomenal job basically four month build start to finish huge overhaul um they completed it just before uh well just after october of 2019 we moved into the new store and we had new uh the new store we had a bunch of new mechanical equipment um but this again was just a, a basically something that we had paid forward um for the that 25 years or so of hard work and determination and turning money back into the business. And so we were, we were super excited. We moved into the store and then uh, like Sean said, you know, 2020, um, COVID, it, it impacted our business um, because people wanted to know where their food comes from. They were, uh, they were disappointed and annoyed with the disruption of the food chain. And so they wanted to turn back to the old ways. Well, this had a simultaneous impact on um, the YouTube channel too, because you might want to learn to butcher at home. And so as the people were constantly reaching out to us saying, hey guys, I watched your video. I couldn't get my pig or my beef into the local processor because they're booked two years out. I decided to do it myself and it worked out. I loved it. I'm going to continue to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to teach my children how to do this thank you for providing us with the information you guys put out there on YouTube. So tons of success stories from people, which is great for us. We love hearing those because that's why we do it. Yeah, so as we had gone through those years of 2015 to 2020, we had been through the, the build, um, again, a financial risk two, twice over again, one with the business model change, we're gonna not do custom processing more. The second one with the big financial, um, you know, reach with with putting on the addition, and we're thankful that we look back now, um, it's worked out really well for us. But we want to point out that you know, again, by our faith, but a lot of decision making that went in, a lot of risk, um, and a lot of hard work, just a tremendous amount of hard work. And we get viewers that find us today, and they don't often see the they see the tip of the iceberg if you will or if you roll into this place you see the facade now um, you really have no idea on what it took to get here so hope with the revelations that we were that we've revealed here that it helps you understand that you know it takes a tremendous amount of hard work passion a little bit of craziness a little bit of a dad that won't mm -hmm. you know won't he'll literally break his foot off in your hind end and um lots of times lots of times and you know, by the grace of God, we sit here today and we're a multi-million dollar company that is completely owned and managed by the, the, the family and the three of us sitting here. There's no, um, there's nobody pulling the strings other than you know, God himself. And of course, we're, we're at the mercy of, of the different uh, you know, things that happen that are outside of our control. But the things that we can control, we feel like we've uh, certainly paid it forward in a big way to get room. And so we continue Absolutely. to develop new products and come up with different ways to lead the brand and stay on the forefront of, you know, not only we the retail the business. Sauce. Yeah, those were all items that we added as we went through. We've taken our original recipe and we've put it out there. And as we continue to grow, we hope to bring in more of our children that are, you know, young now, like you, Spencer, and they can assume different roles in the company, but all by the grace and will of God.
looking back, you know, we have so many stories, so many feelings and emotions. It, we certainly can't get them all into this one hour and a half, two hour video, whatever we decide to do. Um, but unbelievable, you know, story from the Perkins family. L love every aspect of it. Was there times that were difficult? Yes. I mean, will there be more times that are difficult? Yes. I'm sure. I mean, literally like on your hands and knees, crawling up the steps because you couldn't walk anymore. However, um, you know, we're excited about the future of our business. We're excited about, like Scott mentioned, our, our kids coming on, building a foundation, a platform for them so that there's many different things in here um, in this, inside this business for them to do, whether it be, you know, butchering, accounting, a chef, uh, you know, grill technician, uh, uh, video, man, hopefully nobody takes your job, Spencer, but. <laughs> oh, uh, farmer. Assist, you know, here, assistant. Let's just talk about that for a farmer. second. Farmer. Um, Spencer, no, you know, no formal education in, in making videos and, you know, a huge part of our YouTube success is due to you, Spencer. Um, you know, the first time that he picked up a camera and started filming for us and editing videos and we're just like, we're blown away by it. We had our guy. Yeah. And it's like to have our nephew filming videos and editing for us is, is huge. So thanks, Spencer. Yep. Thanks. Good job. He's yeah. good at it. But to think about you know the future of our brand, our business, um, we always plan on being butchers because that's what we are. Um, the Beard of Butcher brand, we just hope that it continues to grow. It's it's growing at a monumental pace. I mean, just year after year, we 10x last year online sales, which is huge. Shipping you know six to seven thousand orders a month. We just moved into uh, our own warehouse for distribution. And we plan on, um, you know, dad always had a dream of putting a pound of ground bison in every household in America. And however that may not happen, we do plan on putting a bottle of Beard of Butcher Blend seasonings or sauces in every household in America and on every grill shelf because we think you guys will absolutely love it. Um, the clean ingredients, People, uh, they like to refer to it as, you know, an addicting spice. Doesn't matter what you're using it on, whether it be for grilling, you know, vegetables, french fries, popcorn, grilled cheese, I mean, whatever. You can literally <laughs> use it on everything. So the future of our brand is, we feel like the sky's the limit. Well, what we want to do is share our experiences because when we go home, we're getting our spice, we're getting our thermometer, we're getting our gloves because we're, we're all family men. And for me personally, one of my favorite things to do is go on my back patio and grill something. And you get the smell of that spice floating up when you're shaking it on. My kids are all out in their bikes and stuff. And, and you know, in Ohio, you know, six months out of the year, it's, it's a little bit crappy weather, but you deal with it. And then of course, with the butchering knowledge, we hope as we get it out there, it gives um, value and it, um, you know, maybe gives people some confidence and, and, and empowers them to go out and um, maybe learn the trade. Mm -hmm. And then we can build back towards having maybe some more butchers um, yeah, the in, butchering in here. Is a dying, dying. It is. Yeah. yeah. We talk about faith, family, food. That's where we're grounded. Um, you know, in, in that comes the out, our, our love for the outdoors and we take you know we spend a lot of time with our families hunting that's where the, you know we were raised hunting um you know around food and just grounded in those you know those maybe the simpler things in life you know we don't need the big fancy you know vacations and stuff like that as long as we can get together in our hunting cabin and you know sit around and play checkers you know we're having a good time so that's, that's what our, our business is grounded on. That's where we plan on taking it. And it's just been, it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal ride. So we're a living testament to the fact that the um, hard work, the dedication, the American dream, if you will, still work by the grace of God. The three of us sit here today. Like Seth said, we're excited about the future. We hope you enjoyed the video, learning a little bit more about the background, maybe that iceberg that you can't see as you as we continue to grow with our brand you understand that um, we support a set of values that we believe are very dear and true that were instilled in us and hopefully we can pass them on to 
the next generation and maybe some of of you guys too. Absolutely. We have a lot of requests for um, if we have an apprenticeship programs here. At the time, we do not. We have about um, seven or eight of them. Yeah, they're, they're just our kids. Yeah. Uh, we do, however, plan on coming up with maybe like an online course or something like that in the future. So, uh, you know, if you or if you're looking to get into the trade, our best suggestion would be go to your local butcher, get a job, start from the ground up. You know, you may need to be in the back cleaning tubs. You know, or you may need to clean lugs and carts and, and, and grinder parts and things like that for the first year or two. Um, but start there, work your way up, get next to an old school butcher, learn the trade. And then um, buy your uh, favorite, you know, anti-aching cream for your, for your <laughs> forearms and yeah. your back. Hurt for a yeah, while. we should yeah. mention, we, we, we do still have our digits. Yeah, I got one big right so, there. Uh, we could go over scars all day, but you know we got the digits, so that's an important part. Um, the saw do you see behind us, that's where all the videos started, and um, that's where we plan on continuing them. So appreciate the support. It's been phenomenal. The channel grows, the views grow, um, the brand grows. The sky's the limit. Thanks for watching, guys. We hope to see you guys next time on The Bearded Butchers.